Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson and today I'm going to be looking at Zona. Now this is an adventure game that takes place in the exclusion zone around Chernobyl, where there was once one of the largest nuclear disasters that happened back in 1986. Now the goal of this game is to be the first player to get two secrets from underground government facilities which will open up a path to the sarcophagus to discover the secrets that lie within. But of course there is a time limit, you don't want to be around when the final admissions happen. Now this gameplay is very much like you know, your typical adventure game. You'll be moving around the board, having encounters with mutants and anomalies, so this is like an alternate uh, present game, performing some tests using dice, and each round player will have an event will happen to them. But the thing that really drew me to this game is the setting and the theme, so I hope the gameplay would draw me into the game. So, was this game an enjoyable one, or was it just a nuclear hot mess? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and we'll come back with my final thoughts on Zona. The Secrets of Chernobyl. So here we have Zona set up for two players. I'm not going to go through all the rules in detail, but hopefully give you enough of an overview of how the game plays. The board is set up and all the decks of cards are placed in their spots. Shuffle the lock tokens and place one on each of the secret areas. Shuffle the secrets decks and place the number of cards equal to the player count at each secret location. The marker board is placed off to one side with the shuffle item and junk decks and turn over the first four cards of each. Separate the threat tokens based on their symbol and place each deck face up in the tray and finally put the emission marker on the zero spot. I'll be going through the cards more in detail as they come up in the overview. Each player will be dealt two character boards and picks which one they want to play. The back of the character board will show you where to put the initial threat tokens, how much damage the character starts with, how much money they start with, where your reputation starts, and where the character themselves start. Flip over the board and place your initial damage, if any, on your board. The front side of your character board will show you your stats, how much damage the character can take, and their special ability. Each player will also be given a backpack board, a fatigue dial, four starting cards for their character, and a reputation marker. The starting player is given the voice of Zona. If there's ever a decision to be made, whoever holds this will make the decision. Now the goal of the game is to reach the sarcophagus of the Chernobyl power plant. The players must first infiltrate the secret government facilities and recover two secret cards. Once they have those, they can go after the sarcophagus. The game is also over and all players lose if the rumor deck runs out. A single player can win the game if they can get to the sarcophagus and have a successful event. Let's have a quick look at the board. There are three different sectors, green, yellow, and red. The closer you get to Chernobyl, the more hazardous it gets. There are bunkers around the board, which will offer you shelter during your missions and offer a place to regroup. There are four secret locations where you'll need to get to to find the secret information on how to get into the sarcophagus. And of course, there is the sarcophagus itself, which is the ultimate goal of the game and cannot be reached until you have the two pieces of secret information. The game is played over a number of rounds. Each round is split into three phases. The action phase, the event phase, then the rumor phase. During the action phase, the player, starting with the person holding the voice of Zona, will take two actions. Your possible actions are movement, you can move your character to an adjacent location. If you enter a zone with a threat token, you must resolve that encounter, which I'll talk about later. If the location you are in has a local action, you can perform the local action as one of your actions. For an action, you can attempt to open up a secret location. If you successfully do the test, flip the token over and the location is now open to all players. Move your token to one of the spaces and look through the secrets and take one of them. You can search in a location to encounter a threat there. You can also rest for an action, which allows you to lower your fatigue dial by one spot. Or you can pass, which will end your turn. Once all players have done their actions, we go to the events phase. Each player will take a card corresponding to their area. If you're in green or yellow zone, you take one of these. If in a secret location, take one of the secret location events. And if you're in the sarcophagus, take one of the sarcophagus event cards. Often, the green and yellow sector events cards will have a specific location on them, then a general location. If you are in one of the named locations, you read that section of the card. Otherwise, read the section that's called Other Location. These event cards can sometimes offer you a choice. You can read both sections before making the choice. These cards might cause you to suffer damage, perform a test, or have an encounter. And I'll talk about tests and encounter in a bit. The final phase of the round is the Rumor Card phase. Draw the top one and follow the instructions. Some rumors are persistent and they stay around and replace any previous persistent rumors. 
or the rumors are one shot and then discarded. You'll also move the emissions marker down as based on the card. If this causes an emission, you do the following. Flip the top card of the emissions deck over so that the two cards make a diagram like this. If any of the players are next to a bunker, they can now spend two fatigue to get into the bunker. Otherwise, all scavengers outside, that is, not in a bunker or a secret location, take damage based on the zone they are in. In green zone, you just take the green damage. In the yellow, you take yellow and green damage. And in the red zone, you take all of the damage on the card. Then, all the rumor tokens, persistent rumor cards, and all the threat tokens are removed from the board. Then you're going to be placing new threat tokens and shown on the emission card. All the cards in the market are wiped and replaced. Let's have a quick look at some of the rules in more detail. So when you need to perform a test, it will usually give you an attribute and a number. You'll always roll three dice and add the results to the attribute you are testing. For every plus you roll, you're going to add one to the result. For every negative, subtract one from the result. And for every triangle, nothing happens unless you roll two triangles. If you do roll two triangles, you're going to suffer one irradiation damage. Now, if you match or exceed the test number, you're going to pass the test overall. If you want to re-roll a die during a test, you can do what is called forcing. That is raising your fatigue by one, and you may re-roll one die. You can only do a one force per test. And often, you want to use an item to modify the die rolls as well. And often, these items will have a usage slot or a damage slot. Whenever you use an item, you're going to place a damage marker on it. If you ever cover up an X on the item card, you will discard the card. Or the card might have no damage spots on it, which means it's a one-time use only. Some items will have a dashed damage box on it. This means they can only be used once per round. Finally, let's talk about threat tokens and fighting. There are two types of threats, anomalies and mutants, but their encounters work the same way. First, flip over the threat token on the board you are encountering. If an event tile tells you to have an encounter, take the appropriate tile from the bottom of the pile. If the threat has an ability, it triggers now as soon as it is flipped over. Then you must pass the detection test. This is an attribute test against your alertness. The pass and fail results are in the green and the red sections. Once you've completed the detection phase, whether you're successful or not, you then get to decide if you actually want to confront the threat. If you don't want to, then you turn the threat back over and you're done. If you do want to confront it, the bottom line will again be a test against one of your attributes. And again, the success and failure are in the green and red sections. Now, if you ever have to take damage, there are three types of damage in the game. And different items can protect you against different types of damage. But whenever you suffer damage that you could not protect against, you'll put a damage token on your character. If you ever have to place more damage that you can hold, then you discard all the excess damage and add a minus one marker to your character, which will permanently reduce an ability. If you ever have three weakness tokens and need to place a fourth, your character has died. So a quick recap. The goal of the game is to get two items from two different secret locations on the board and make your way to the sarcophagus and have a successful encounter there. The first player to do this will win. If the rumor deck ever runs out, then all players have lost. Now I've skipped over a lot of rules to keep this short, so please don't use this as a how to play guide, but I wanted to give you an overview of how the game generally works. Let's get back to see what I thought about Zona. So let's start like we normally do with theme and components. The theme, you know what, like most themes is going to be a personal taste. But for me, I really enjoy this theme and it's very well integrated into the game. You know, from the rule book kind of looking like a government manual, to the little blurb at the start of the rule book, to the characters themselves, and even the events that happen all work so well together to really create an immersive theme to this game. And a theme that I'd really like to see more games of in the future. Now the components themselves are very high quality. You know what, from the cards to the board, which by the way is double-sided based on player count and is quite the table hog as you saw from the walkthrough, even to the minis. Even the backpack and character cards having little indentations to hold, you know, either the cards or weaknesses are just nice added touches to the components. Now the art is, for the most part, really well done. The art of the characters and board is really nice and most of the creatures and anomalies are well done. Not all of them, but most of them are. Now I do want to say that the uh, game, according to the back of the box, is rated ages 18 plus. You know what, and I can kind of see that for some, with some of the creatures and situations from the events. Now there's no huge amounts of blood and gore, but it's definitely more an adult theme to this game. So even if the game looks good, what about the gameplay? I think for the most part, the game does a good job of matching the gameplay with the theme and components. So let's see what I liked about the game. Now the basis of the game, 
what you want to do and how you're doing it is actually fairly straightforward. You only have an option of five things to do on your turn. You know, you move, do a local action, open a secret location, which is only going to happen a maximum of four times per game, search, have an encounter, or you rest. That's it. Once you've done your main actions, you pull one of those event cards, and that was my favorite part of the game. Each player takes a different card, and that event will happen to them. I thought the cards were very well done and offered some really tough choices, you know, in the game. It really does help to draw you into the theme. But even, even still, often the choices are not straightforward. This was the most enjoyable section of the game, and the main reason why I kept wanting to come back to play the game. The story has been told through these event cards was very intriguing. Also for me, that increases the game's replayability. I want to try the game again to see what, ha what story happens this time. Now the ultimate goal is always the same, but how you get there, what, what experiences you, your character has will change from game to game. Another, although frustrating, well done aspect of the game was the items. If you go into the game understanding that your character is probably at the fringe of legality and is making do with what they can find, the equipment you get is not top quality and will eventually break. Now you do have some choices when you use the items, but eventually they will have to be replaced. There is better equipment to be found in the secret facilities or if you can find an artifact, but those artifacts kind of bring their own level of risk. Now I enjoyed the item interplay of the game and constantly thinking of when the best to use my equipment was, but I can kind of see that this may be a sticking point and I may talk about it a bit later. Now the missions track is also something you always, you always need to be watching as well. I mean, getting caught out when there's a mission will do substantial damage to you. But you know what, you kind of watch for it. You know that each rumor card will have, uh, will force you to move the emissions, you know, zero, one or two spaces. So when it gets down to the bottom of the track, you better end your turn next to or inside a bunker just to be on the safe side until the emission threat has passed. Unfortunately, I didn't feel that all the gameplay was at the same level and I did have a few issues with the game. The rule book, although it's nicely done, is 25 pages long and that's okay but it really needs an index or something to quickly find out what happens when you do something or when something happens in the game. And it's not exactly well laid out for figuring out where to look in the book. And there's a high level of randomness, which is okay, but can be frustrating. You learn very quickly that if your character has low might, you just avoid all mutant encounters because uh, you just can't defeat many of them. But sometimes it's just out of your control. You turn over an event card and it says, hey, you have to fight a mutant and your might is one. Ah, uh, well, good luck with that. And sometimes you can, or one of your opponents can just breeze through events, or you just happen to have the right item at the right time. It really just means you didn't plan well, you just kind of got lucky. Another aspect, although, and not a major one, was I was not a big fan of the take that element to the game. Whoever has the voice of Zona gets to make all the decisions. Need to place a mutant? They decide. Need to pick an area that which is impassable? They decide. And of course they're making so it benefits them. And this raises another issue with the game. That for me was actually the player count. In a two player game, you know what, it really doesn't feel as good as a three to four player game. With two players, there are four secret facilities. So I found we just ended up splitting them and there's no competition. And since you usually open the door and spend an event there, you tended to get both of the secret cards and emptied out the facility within a turn or two. Now with the three or four players, there's definitely more interaction in terms of, you know, trying to get a facility before someone else or to try and get the, you know, especially to, try to get the secret within. The other aspect of the game I was not a big fan of was how quickly you can die. Not only is being out during a mission an almost certain death, healing yourself is more difficult. And when you take weakness, your damage doesn't reset. You just remove the excess damage, which I wasn't quite sure I understood. If you took another damage, you would get another weakness. I would prefer the weakness resets your damage track. It seemed kind of overly punishing when you were kind of already down. And honestly, a lot of the damage is just done by randomness. You turn over an event card and you take damage and there's nothing you can do about it. And the items themselves, some items are clearly better than others in the game. And when you see them in a shop, you want to be the one to get them. Weapons are few and far between in the game, but they almost always help you out with half the encounters being, you know, mutants. But using the items seems a bit too cumbersome for how basic they really are. I understand the fragility of the items is part of the theme and that's well done. But why can I only shoot my gun two times before it breaks? It just made that aspect of the game of trying to manage the items just really cumbersome. So with all these negatives and positives, what would I recommend this game? Now, I really like the theme components and the art throughout the game. I thought the event cards were the most interesting and enjoyable part of the game. The emissions track 
was an interesting timer and a sweep of the game. You know, sometimes you really need to go uh, to get sweep the board or wipe the board and put out new threats. So you might need something else to complete uh, one of the one of uh, the quests that you're trying to do. Now, I wasn't a big fan of the sometimes convoluted rule set. The randomness did on several occasions diminish the enjoyment I was having from the game, especially at the sarcophagus, where who won really kind of came down to a random event pool. I didn't feel the game scaled well. It's definitely better with more players, but that will slow the game down. And the damage on both players and the weapons, while enjoyable at first, became more of an annoyance than anything else. I think, after all that, I would still recommend this game if this theme interests you. For me, the theme and the immersion overwhelm some of the more clunky aspects of the game, but it's not a perfect game by far. But I sure had fun playing it, so I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10 and a Dice Tower seal of approval if, you, the, if the theme really interests you. And that's it for the moment. So as always, until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.